So we're going to lock in on all three locations tonight, and we're going to do something a little bit different. I don't want you to get your Bibles out. I don't want you to take any notes. You're like, good. <laughs> I just want you to sit back and relax and listen. You're like, boy, I like this already. <laughs> to kick off a series that we've entitled Freedom From, to kind of lock in on um, Patriotic Week, the 4th of July, I want... And this is important. I need everybody to pay attention. I want to exercise my freedom of speech. <laughs> to tell you a story. It's really a warning. So what I want you to do is I want you to exercise your freedom to pay attention. <laughs> and I want you to listen. The service is going to turn a little bit, and I need us to be sobered up for a few moments. I, I, my, my goal here is not to be Debbie Downer, but I look at the state of our country that I love, and I'm concerned. Amen. So I'll exercise my freedom of speech for a few minutes. <laughs> They had no idea what was coming. They thought it would go on as it always had, as if the world would never change. They had no idea what was about to happen or what it was all leading up to. Everything they had ever known up until that point, their entire world would vanish. They should have known. It was all there from the beginning, but they forgot. Forgot what, you say? Their purpose, their foundation, that which made them unique. No other nation had been called into being for the will of God or dedicated to his purposes from conception. No other people had been given a covenant, but the covenant had a condition. If they followed the ways of God, they would become the most blessed of nations. But if they fell away and turned against his ways, then their blessings would be removed and replaced by calamity. But why would they turn away if they were given so much, you ask? It's a mystery, a kind of spiritual amnesia. When it all began, they were still using God's name, but with less and less meaning behind it. Then they started merging God, confusing him with the little gods of the nations. Then they began turning against him, subtly at first, then outright, then brazenly, driving him out of their national life and bringing in idols to fill the void. The land became covered with idols and altars to foreign gods. They rejected their covenant, abandoned their standards, and exchanged the values they had always lived by for those they had never known. Spirituality for sensuality, holiness for profanity, righteousness for self-interest. They cut themselves off from the faith on which their nation had been established and became strangers to God. And as for their most innocent, their little children, they offered them up as sacrifices. They literally killed their own children on the altars of their newfound gods. That's how far they descended. Everything was now upside down. What they had once known was right, they now saw as outdated, intolerant, and immoral. And once, what they once knew as immoral, they now championed and celebrated as sacred. They had transformed themselves into the enemies of the God they had once worshipped and the faith they had once followed until the very mention of his name was banned from public squares. And yet in spite of all of this, God was merciful and called to them again and again, pleading with them, warning them, calling them to return. 
but they rejected the call. They declared war on those who remained faithful. They branded them as troublemakers, irritants, dangerous, and finally, enemies of the state. They were marginalized, vilified, persecuted, even hunted down. So the nation grew deaf to the call of those trying to save them from judgment. The alarm would have to grow louder and the warnings more severe. They would enter a new stage. God would remove the hedge he had placed around them, the hedge of protection of national security that kept them safe up until that point. As long as it was in place, they were safe. No enemy, no empire, no power on earth could touch them. But once it was removed, everything changed. Their enemies could now enter, breach their land, enter their gates. It was a new phase, much more dangerous than before. Thus began the days of calamities and shakings, the days of final warnings. When did this all happen? When was this hedge removed? Actually, 732 BC. I'm talking about the nation of Israel. Brent, maybe I'm missing something. What does all this that happened two and a half thousand years ago have to do with anything? I mean, was it, what does it have to do with why we're here? Why am I even listening to this? What does all this have to do with America? Israel was unique among the nations in that it was conceived and dedicated at its foundation for the purposes of God. But there was another civilization also conceived and dedicated to the will of God from its conception, America. America is America, Israel is Israel. One does not replace the other, but America's founders established the new commonwealth after the pattern of ancient Israel. They dedicated to God and saw it as a covenant with him. So it was in covenant with God. What does that mean? They believed that if America followed the ways of God, it would become the most blessed, the most prosperous, the most powerful civilization on earth. From the very beginning, they foretold it. And what they foretold would come true. America would rise to heights no other nation had ever attained. Now, it was never without fault or sin, but it would always aspire one way or another to fulfill the calling and vision by its founders at its inception. Which was what, you ask? To be a vessel of redemption, a light to the world. And so it would give refuge to the world's poor and needy, hope to its oppressed. It would stand more than once against dark movements of the modern age that threaten to engulf the world and liberate millions from oppression. And in the process, it would become the most blessed, the most prosperous, the most powerful, the most revered nation on earth, just as its founders envisioned. So God honored it. They're dedicating America to its purposes. However anybody wants to look at it, the fact remains they dedicated America to God. And what they foretold came true. America became the most blessed nation on earth. It bears out what the Bible reveals concerning the fate of nations. Righteousness exalts a nation. But that statement's not finished. There is a but coming. In the case of Israel, there was always another side. If they stopped following God, turned against him, their blessings would be withdrawn and be replaced with curses. 
But wasn't Israel surrounded by nations much worse, you ask? With no concept of God, why would Israel be judged so much? Because to whom much is given, much is required. And no nation had ever been given so much. None had ever been so spiritually blessed before. So the standards were higher, the stakes were greater, and the judgment, when it came, more severe. And America, you say? America has done much good. There's no shortage of nations far exceeding the faults and sins of America. But no nation in the modern world has ever been given so much. None has really ever been so blessed. To much is given, much is required. Righteousness exalts a nation, but sin is a reproach to any people. If a nation so blessed by God should turn away from him, what then? So the question, has America turned away from God? The answer is, it has turned and is turning. How? The same nation that formed was formed after the pattern of Israel now follows after the pattern of its moral descent, its spiritual departure from God. As it was in Israel's descent, so too in America's. It began with a complacency toward God then spiritual confusion, then merging God with idols, then ultimately the rejection of his ways. Just as with ancient Israel, America began ruling God out of its life, turning step by step against his ways, at first subtly, then more and more brazenly. When? When did this start? There's no simple answer. In America's greatest moments, there's always been sin and in its worst moments, greatness. But there are critical junctures. In the middle of the 20th century, America began officially removing God from its national life. It abolished prayer and scripture in public schools. As ancient Israel had removed the Ten Commandments from its national consciousness, so America has done likewise. Removing the Ten Commandments from public viewing, banning it from public squares, taking it down by government decree from its walls. As it was in ancient Israel, so too in America. God progressively driven out of its national public life. The very mention of the name of God or Jesus Christ in any relevant context became more and more taboo and unwelcome unless for the purpose of mockery or attack. That which had been revered as sacred was now increasingly treated as profanity. And as God was driven out, idols were brought in to replace him. But Americans don't worship idols. No, we just don't call them idols. As God was expunged from American life, idols came in to fill the void. Idols of sensuality, greed, money, success, comfort, materialism, pleasure, sexual immorality, self-worship, and the latest self-obsession. The sacred increasingly disappeared. The profane took its place. Another kind of spiritual amnesia. The nation forgot its foundings, its purpose, its calling. The standards and values it had long upheld are now abandoned. What we once knew as immoral is now totally accepted. Its culture was increasingly corrupted by sexual immorality, growing continuously more crude and vulgar. A wave of pornography began penetrating its media. The same nation that once had been dedicated to spreading God's light to the nation now fills the world with the pornographic and the obscene. Some would call that tolerance, you might say. Yes but the same tolerance that overtook ancient Israel. A tolerance for everything opposed to God. A growing tolerance for immorality. A growing intolerance for the pure. A tolerance that mocked 
marginalized, condemn those who remain faithful to the values now being discarded. Innocence was ridiculed and virtue is now vilified. Children are taught of sexual immorality in public schools while the word of God is banned. It was a tolerance that put the profane on public display and removed nativity scenes from public sight. Contraband, as if somehow it's a threat, a strangely intolerant tolerant, if you ask me. But still, how does all this compare to what happened with Israel? America doesn't offer its children on the altars of sacrifice, does it not? Ten years after removing prayer and scripture from public schools, the nation legalized the killing of its unborn. The blood of the innocent now stained its collective hands. Israel had sacrificed thousands on the altars of Moloch and Baal. But by the dawn of the 21st century, America had sacrificed millions. For thousands, judgment came swiftly and harshly on Israel. What then of America? Is America in danger of judgment, you might ask? Come on! I mean, it can't be that bad. It's not nearly as bad as it was in ancient Israel. They came against the prophets of God, Brent. If God sent a message today to America calling it back, people would listen. Would we? Today, we have deafened our ears to the voice of God and mostly his promises. We're given a wonderful promise in 2 Chronicles chapter 7, verse 14. If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves, pray, seek my face, turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven, forgive their sins, and heal their land. If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves, pray, seek my face, turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven, I will forgive their sins, and I will heal.
You're like, wow, I'm depressed. (laughs) About six weeks ago, when I was thinking about this service this week, thinking about this series that we're going to entitle Freedom From, and we're going to journey for the next four weeks, so be here if you can. If you're on vacation, I understand, but it's going to be great. You're going to hear from different perspectives. This is going to be a really fascinating series that we need to tackle and talk about. I went back to what I did, the very first uh, message in a series called Signs. It's hard to believe that series, and it was really dealing with the end times, was five years ago in just a few weeks. And so some of you might have been around when I read that. It's actually from the first chapter of a book called The Harbinger. It's a very interesting read. And man, is it not us today. It's where we live. I'm going to say this to you, you know, I love America, America's great. I'm a patriotic guy. God bless America. But I really am getting kind of tired for many of us, especially Christians, that we keep saying, God, please bless America. God, please bless America. God already has blessed America. God is with us. The big question is, are we with him? And so I would just ask that you take, around, you, you take a look around your own lifestyle. Before you get mad, um, the people that we've seen on TV this last month, lots of things going on in our world today that we're like, I can't believe we celebrate this as sacred today. We're so, listen, you know what? Lots of people today actually live out what they believe. I worry sometimes that Christians, we don't live out what we believe. Our lifestyles are just like everyone else's. And if we don't watch it, we're going to get washed downstream. And we're going to start thinking what we used to believe is, hey, from the Word of God is this is what we absolutely need to believe. This is not optional. This is foundational. Many of us today are like, eh, it's okay. Why do we say that? Because the culture preaches it and we just believe it. America's great. I could be cute. I could be funny. I could talk to you. I mean, I have lots of funny things. I actually thought about it. I'm like, oh, man, I'm going to get everybody so depressed. I need to roll back into some things funny. I don't know, like in America, when, when we transport something by car, we call it a shipment. And when we transport something by a ship, we call it cargo. <laughs> In America, many of us know this, we park $30,000 cars on the street so we can store $300 of junk in our garage. In America, we actually have interstate highways in Hawaii. (laughs) Only in America, right? Only in America do drugstores make the sick people walk all the way to the back of the store. (laughs) That is true, right? While the healthy people can buy your cigarettes right up front. (laughs) Only in America do we order a double cheeseburger, large fries, and a Diet Coke, just for the taste of it. (laughs) But this is what I found interesting, and this is what we'll close with. We're going to close with something inspirational here. I just want to talk to you for a few minutes, and I want you to remember a few things, especially about America's foundation. The paradox of our time, the sadness of America. See if you track with me because I really think this is so true. The paradox of our time in history is that we have taller buildings and shorter tempers. We spend more and we have less. We buy more and we enjoy less. We have bigger houses and smaller families. More conveniences but less time. We have more degrees on the wall, but less common sense. Those are the people that didn't go to college. (laughs) We have more knowledge, less judgment, more experts today than ever before, but yet we have more problems. More medicine, less wellness. We drink too much. (laughs) Mm. oh boots smoke too much spin too recklessly laugh too little 
I actually have people get on me. Do you understand? This is my world. I get hate mail that I make you guys laugh too much. <laughs> we drive too fast. Get too angry. Some of you are like, ooh. Stay up way too late. We get up too tired. I'll say amen to that. We read too little. Watch way too much TV. Spend way too much time online. And yet we don't have any time to pray. We have multiplied our possessions but reduced our values. We talk too much, love too seldom, hate too often. We've learned how to make a living, but we forgot how to have a life. We've added years to life, but not life to years. We've been all the way to the moon and back, but now have trouble crossing the street to say hey to a next door neighbor. We've done larger things, but not better things. We're working hard to clean up our air, so what, that we've polluted our souls. We write more, but learn less. We plan more, but accomplish less. We've learned to rush, but not to wait. Max Licato, one of my favorite authors, said this about America, the country of shortcuts and fast lanes. We're the only nation on earth with a mountain called Rushmore. <laughs> Again, someone he said, we keep asking God to bless America. He already has. Now we are running away from that blessing. Why? I just want to remind you of a few words. At each campus, we're going to close in just a minute with just a few songs that are needed to be sung because we need some inspiration and we need a challenge. I want to remind you of some words from our founding fathers. You're like, Brent, I don't want to hear it, but we need to hear it. We forgot how this nation was founded. Listen to just a three quotes. Some of you know, sadly, I don't think many of us do. Patrick Henry will say these words. You're like, give me liberty or give me death. He said other words. Listen to what he says. It cannot be emphasized too strongly or too often that this great nation was founded not by religionists, but by Christians, not on religion, but on the gospel of Jesus Christ. George Washington actually said these words in his farewell address to the nation. Do not let anyone claim tribute of American patriotism if they even attempt to remove religion from politics. Thomas Jefferson, in his address to a Danbury Baptist convention, actually said, the First Amendment has created a wall of separation between church and state. But that wall is a one-directional wall. It keeps the government from running the church, but it makes sure that Christian principles will always stay in government. I will say it, I will say it, I will say it. I believe it to be true. I understand many of us are Trump supporters. Some of us are Democrats. The solution to our problems in our world, especially in our country, will not be found in the White House, the State House, or the Courthouse. It will only be found in God's house. But, and this is for us, there are many people in this room, you are quick to jump up Greensboro, South Knoxville, and pledge our allegiance to the flag, but we sit back and we never do anything with the freedom that that flag symbolizes. That is like me professing to be a Christian and never doing anything Christ-like. We have to start participating. You're like, fine, I'll vote. That's not what I mean. We can participate. Here's how we can participate. You want to change your world? By living the truth and let everyone around you see who you are living for. That's good.
freedom is costly and freedom is demanding. Freedom costs this country a lot. A lot of men and women have given their lives. Freedom is demanding. Not to quote the American president, the movie, but you want advanced citizenship, it's going to be hard. You'll be in for a fight. Today, Scott and I talk about this a lot on staff. People don't want truth today. They want preference. As long as truth aligns with our preference or our lifestyle choices, we're good, but we don't align our preferences with the truth anymore. The Bible says you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. Just remember that as we celebrate the 4th of July tomorrow. Celebrate our Independence Day. Celebrate the freedoms that we have to worship the one true God, to remember its foundings, our nation's foundings, and pass them on to the next generation. I'll always be proud to be an American. I'll always say, as I pray, God bless America. But if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then God will hear from heaven and heal our land. Are we prepared to do that? God, thank you for this opportunity to be in church tonight. I know this service has been really different, and that's cool. I think more than ever before, we need moments like this just to stop, be kind of jolted, be challenged. We think today we're on this American ride and no one's ever been down this road before. Come on. Ancient Israel walked down the same path. And we read in your word what happened when they began to turn away from you. We see that in our own nation. We might can't do anything about everybody, but as for me and my house, we will serve you. As for us and, and, and this church, we will serve you. We will be a light. We will continue to be proud to be Americans. We will continue to pray, God, bless America. But God, we want to be with you. We surrender to you. We give our lives to you. We want to anchor down on what we believe and why we believe it. In Jesus' name we pray.